The life of Lauren Manning is an unforgettable lesson in the power of hope and strength. A former executive and partner of Capital, Cantor Fitzgerald has endured catastrophic injuries and devastating loss when terror struck the World Trade Center on 9-11. Manning's will to, the, to live and her resolve to rebuild her life continues to resonate powerfully around the world more than a decade later. Lauren recounts her journey in her best-selling memoir, Unmeasured Strength. She is also the subject of New York Times bestseller, Love, Greg, and Lauren. The recipient of many honors, among them Lauren was chosen as one of CNN's most intriguing newsmakers through their first 25 years, and was named Glamour Magazine's Woman of the Year. Manning is the co-founder and chief strategist for uBoard.net, and she is also a managing director of Golden Seeds, one of the nation's leading early stage investment firms focused on funding opportunities for women-led companies. Currently, Lauren is involved with iPads for Soldiers. She also serves on the board of Sanctuary for Families and the advisory board of Glamour Magazine's Woman of the Year. Here to share with us her amazing story of courage and resilience, please join me in welcoming Lauren Manning. Thank you, thank you. It is wonderful to be here with you all today. Today is particularly a special honor for me because my presence on this stage was so highly unlikely 13 years ago. But because in no small part, because of people in your profession, I am here to tell the story. We are connected, I believe, not because of background, geography or education or in spite of, but rather in a much grander way. We are united by the compelling and unified desire to seek the best outcome, to succeed, to win. Right now, in sick rooms from Africa to Spain to right here in Dallas, wherever there is a nurse, there is the most miraculous global force occurring united for the cause of one, fighting for each individual, trying to protect us all. You, the nurses, are the centuries defending the position that can't be surrendered, the commandos who must meet every situation on the ground and rely on their training to prevail, who refuse to leave any man or woman behind. When I suffered my injuries in 2001, the truth was I should have died by any objective analysis. I existed far outside of the bell curve. I was told it, I heard it repeatedly by the doctors, yet I survived. And not just because I believed I would, but because despite their doubt, no one surrendered to the overwhelming odds. When I was admitted to the burn floor on the evening of September 11th, I heard of this wild-eyed nurse standing by the elevator, masked and gloved, all six foot seven inches of him, like a soldier ready to attack and he grimly shouted, next, as my gurney rolled by. That was Andrew Greenway, who would prove to be one of the kindest, finest, most talented, and emotionally generous nurses on that floor. And he was the last person I would hug when I was discharged from that ICU three months later. That night, though, he had his war face on, and he and his team were engaged in a battle on my behalf and the few other survivors that had made it onto that floor that night. Thanks to their teamwork, I lived to deliver, to deliver a message to you today, which is that if you believe you will prevail and you will succeed, whatever your trials may be, because I believe that ultimately love 
love for what you do, love for what you believe is possible, even improbable, is what defined my survival. That love brought hope, and that hope was everywhere. I turned to it in the darkest of times. Now, imagine taking a step back, going to work. Today, much as you've entered this conference center, walked across the skywalk, and as you walk into the exhibit hall lobby, a violent attack begins. What turns out to be the worst peacetime attack in the history of this country. You entered the building healthy on a routine day, and suddenly you find yourself covered in flames. Now imagine being exiled to a netherworld of unconsciousness and waking up to a life and a world that would never be the same. Now think about it. What would you do? What would be the first thing you would do? Well, I come here today to tell you a story about the probable and the impossible. And what I did when something happened to me that could have happened to any one of us on any given day. It is a story about mastering fear and about finding your own unmeasured strength. I've lived a life filled with challenges, failure and success, and with the story, I'd like to tell you about my own crisis and transformation. I hope you'll tune in to hear about the journey once upon a time 13 years ago. So let me start at the beginning. I grew up in a small town as a young child in Germany named Waldorf, and later another bastion of internationalism called New Jersey in uh, that housewife town, Franklin Lakes, <laughs> until I went to college in New York City, and except for a brief time, I've called that home ever since. I was, I was raised by a homemaker mom who forsook a medical career and a Marine father. My dad had served during the Korean War, had, as had many generations of our family in the U.S., and upon his release, he finished his graduate degree and he entered the corporate ranks of ITD, a very large conglomerate back in the 60s and 70s. He had a military bearing and a baritone voice and a very firm handshake. He commanded respect. And I know that he left more than one boyfriend of mine quaking in his sneakers. But believe me when I tell you my mom was just as tough-minded as he was. But me, beneath it all, they were kind and generous, and most of all, they listened. They had the ability to listen, which I also often found frustrating at times when I didn't believe they were listening to me. They believed in hard work, perseverance, and no shortcuts, really, because they don't really happen often in reality. And not uniquely, my work ethic as a teenager was the opposite, total rebellion. So my brother and sister and I lived a fairly traditional home life. And academically, things came pretty easy for me. And as I got older, I left for college a year early. And I had a, an epiphany, an existential crisis of sorts. And I was gripped by a fear I'd never felt before. I questioned everything. And I thought, medieval history, Renaissance literature, what is it all about? And, and I couldn't get it anymore. And I said to my parents, why am I bothering with it? And they eventually said to me, well, why do you bother with it? We are not paying for it. So if you want to go, you will pay for it yourself. I found myself at that time with no job, no income, and no future. And so with no other option, I looked in the local paper and I found myself a job at a local pharmacy working the counter, and for the next nine months, I, I graduated to assistant stock manager. I went to school at night at a local college, 
And I began to figure things out. And I came to share in their belief in the importance of hard work. I'd finally gotten it. And I began to understand that sometimes you got to go here before you can go there. And although it may not seem logical, it makes sense perhaps in the long run. And I became less afraid of being that perfect child and continued to make mistakes, but allowing myself to. And I felt okay about it. Once out of college, I wanted nothing more than to work on Wall Street. And so I went to work at Lehman Brothers. I was able to get a job in their coveted training program. And I worked for a guy named Marty Shafroff. And as I started working at Lehman Brothers for a grand total of, I think, $16,000 a year, and hopeful to get a bonus, I started working toward my master's degree. Wall Street was a tough place to work, especially for women, and it still is in many ways. But I wanted it. I loved it. I worked 60, 70 plus hours a week, and I couldn't get enough of it. And as with most businesses, after a few years, those who lacked the skills and the commitment or the stamina were weeded out by being fired or attrition. And the most successful people I found were the people who had the most conviction, the most passion. They weren't always the smartest, but they were the most driven. And I realized success was driven entirely by what you put into it. That simple equation, which we all understand. There was no sense of entitlement on the street. And what I learned was if you studied your client and your business well enough, you could overcome your fears, their fears, their concerns. You could engage their trust. And that trust was the key to unlocking money, to building a deal, to getting a deal done. I was involved in some of Wall Street's biggest deals, biggest transformations. I weathered the stock market crash of 1987, the dot-com crash of the early 90s, the LDC bond debacle. Tried to start a financial consultancy only to see it fail. And I endured a host of other challenges in what is much like your own world, an unforgiving world of finance. And in 1992, I joined Cantor Fitzgerald, one of the world's leading bond and brokerage firms. I came in to run the business development group to push into carbon and emissions and interest rate swap areas and did pretty well. And not long after, I was asked to lead the initiative to move the treasury bond market from voice brokering to an electronic black box known as eSpeed. Now, the treasury bond market was a trillion dollar a year market, $20 trillion to be exact at that time, but it was a Wild West kind of thing. Guys, women on the phone, giving color, giving market insight, a lot of entertaining. Back then, it was all voice, again, all people, hundreds of millions of dollars with a couple of spoken words. The traders who spoke the words to the brokers loved the comforting voice. Nobody wanted a change. Eastfeed was faster, it was cheaper. But unsurprisingly, they wanted none of it. They were making a lot of money, and their motto was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. My job was to overcome with my team that intense opposition. And it wouldn't be like herding cats. It was more like herding the most serious alpha dogs on Wall Street. And their resistance, ultimately, I found out, came from fear. But it didn't make them any less ferocious. But it signaled the path forward. So rather than challenging them, I got them together in a more collegial atmosphere, sat down, put the broker on the site with them, with that black box they were so fearful of, and things began to clarify and correct mistakes, weren't made as much as they thought. The brokers at the site was the answer to the solution. They knew their broker wasn't going to be fired. And therein began, began an evolutionary change in the business. Now, fast forward a year ago, that company was sold to NASDAQ for nearly a billion dollars. And the firms who refused to adapt 
have long since disappeared, but the firms with the courage to try new things are still around. And in, what I learned in the financial markets was if you make a mistake, millions, trillions can be lost in a minute and your career over in the next. The company, yourself, fail. So success in business, I learned, became a matter of life and death. And then one day, I experienced a crisis that taught me the opposite was equally true, that life and death are a matter of business. By the fall of 2001, I had become the head of Kenner Fitzgerald's Global Market Data Division. The firm was trading over 30 trillion a year in treasuries. I ran the data side, about $150 million a year business. At that time, we were bringing in-house. And I was the managing director and partner with an office up on the 105th floor of One World Trade, the North Tower, as many of you may know it. And on September 11th, I was heading for my office, as I did every day. But it was about 30 minutes later than usual because of an epic dog ate my homework story involving a fresh apple pie, a house key, and a black Labrador retriever. We had had a small farmhouse upstate. We rented it out during the summer, and we were refinancing it. Our tenant had left the key to the house taped to an apple pie bag, in which was an apple pie for our caretaker, left it on her door. And that morning when she let out Maggie, Maggie had an extra special treat. The apple pie was gone, the key was gone. That dog had a roughage for the day, no doubt. But when Mary called me to tell me the story, I couldn't have been more annoyed. I had a meeting that morning, I was running late, had a 10-month-old at home, waiting for the sitter to come in. I hustled, finally got someone to bring over another key. So I was still annoyed at the delays as I headed down to the Trade Center, about a mile from my house. And parked under that port cashier in the cab, quickly paid the driver, hustled to get out, running into the building. As I walked into the building, I smiled at two women who were standing on my right as I turned toward the elevator banks that would start my trip up to the 105th floor. When suddenly, the entire building shuddered. Everything moved. It was as if the 110-story tower had somehow jumped. And unbeknownst to me, at that moment, the first plane had just been crashed into the North Tower's 91st floor, cutting through the central core of the building. The atmosphere was surreal, and it was punctuated by a, a piercing, whistling sound that grew steadily louder. Now, the elevator has 90, the tower has 90, nine elevators, but only three ran up the full 110 stories. And that screaming sound was the massive onrushing of compressed air, the jet fuel explosion careening down those three elevator shafts with a direct path to the lobby. The sound grew intensely loud, and a second later, because explosions travel at thousands of feet per second, a wall of fire and thousand degree heat burst from the elevator banks, igniting everything in its path. The blast spun me around, and there was a gale force backdraft back toward the elevators that pulled me in toward the fire. My voice was powerless. I could not speak, I could not breathe. There was a velocity of wind that seemed like hundreds of miles an hour filled with flames enveloping me. And as I turned to struggle against it, where the two women had been standing moments before their bodies lay on the floor covered in flames. And like them, I was on fire. I had to continue to battle against this backdraft as the 40-foot-high glass wall of the lobby finally exploded outward and the air rushed back in to fill the void of the explosion. And it, it seemed like forever that, that howling wind 
careened in my ears as I was thrown out and literally dropped where I had stood just moments before outside that port cachere. Now, I had traveled back maybe 60 feet, but I was in a completely different world. The flames continued to penetrate, and I thought, this can't be real, this can't be real, but it was. The pain was unimaginable. The burn's grip was crushing a weightless force with an infinite power. Everywhere around me was smoke and destruction. And across that highway, West Street was a single strip of grass by the World Financial Center, the only grass in sight, and I knew my only chance to potentially put out the flames. And so I ran toward it. And that journey across West Street's six lanes of highway seemed to last for an eternity. I felt myself going down as I careened over a barrier, but I willed myself forward because all I could think of at that moment was my son, Tyler, just 10 months old at the time, and I screamed, I can't leave you now. I won't leave you now. I haven't had you long enough. And as I reached the grass, I went to do what we all learned in grade school. I dropped and rolled. And as I started to do that, two men came across that hill, a trader and a bond salesman from, of all places, Lehman Brothers. They'd come running to help those few that were able to get out of the building who, like me, had been on fire. One of them grabbed his jacket and started to help me put out the last of the flames. And as I lay there, on my back, I looked up at the sheer cliff of the building where I had worked, and amid the agony, I heard distant sounds of glass breaking and steel wailing as it bent and twisted, crashing to the ground. Objects started to come crashing to the ground, and the tower's upper stories were in flames, and it was easy to see that it was the 105th floor and above my office. And through the haze, of that all-consuming pain, drilling deeper and deeper, somewhat improbably, I saw the second jet hit. And then I knew it had not been an accident. I'd been there in 93 when the terrorists first hit us, and now I knew they had come back for us. We always imagined that they would, and the others, as I looked across the grass, who had fled, now lay motionless and unresponsive, and I felt myself, too, slipping away. And I felt that in that moment, if I could just close my eyes and sink down into that darkness, it would all be gone. Somehow the pain would be gone. And the impulse to let go became overwhelming. And for an unspeakable moment, I prayed for death though I did not believe that even death could release me from this pain. And then I realized with a strange but certain clarity that this was it. This was my moment, my choice. I either had to keep fighting or surrender, and I would die on the side of that highway. And so I made my choice. I decided to live. I refused to give in. I fought to remain awake, and I used that pain that came in ever larger swells to ground myself. I became hyper aware of my surroundings, the extraordinary green in the grass, the way my hands look. I was still alert when an ambulance, as they were pulling up, kept pulling to the other side, finally pulled up in what seemed like the nearest one on the other side of the street. Of course, the EMTs all running the other way into the building. But I knew that this was it. This was my last chance. And somehow I managed to walk with the bond trader who had stayed on that hill, back more 100 feet across that highway to that ambulance. So they threw me on a gurney and shoved me into the floor of the ambulance. 
And the ambulance didn't move, though. No one came to take care of me. My agony grew and grew, and I screamed for help. The benches on either side became crowded with people, torn pants, bleeding legs. They all looked away from me, and still no one tended me. And I knew then that I had been pegged as a goner. But one woman didn't look away. She told the MTs, help her, help her, Mrs. Rivera. Someone laid a jacket over me, and at last, the ambulance finally moved. Nearly 55 minutes after that first plane hit, less than 10 minutes before the South Tower fell. My first stop that morning was St. Vincent's Hospital down in the West Village. They, they didn't know burn protocol down there that well for such a case as this. They hooked me up to a morphine drip that I was to use with my hands. Of course, I couldn't use it. The city was now on lockdown. The, girls, the nurses were calling Wild Cornell Burn Center uptown for protocol. The doctor stood in the hallway, unconscious throughout all of this. I say, call my husband, call my husband. He comes to my side. I say, am I going to be all right? He says, you'll be just fine. And so at that moment, we took one another at our words. He would only tell me later about the black and grilled flaps of stench, skin and the stench of burnt skin filling the air. And as he looked out the door, a social worker walked by and she would later recount a story to us. Social worker went down to the chapel. Cities on lockdown. Any medical personnel that were in that city, visiting or otherwise, gathered at the front doors of hospitals, ready to help. That nurse prayed. Then she went out into the corridor and said, do we have any burn doctors here? Do we have any burn nurses? <laughs> and in answer to her prayer, two women stepped forward, two nurses from Minnesota, they were visiting the city. <laughs> Here they were, they stepped forward in answer to her prayers, came upstairs, scrubbed up, and began the care that I needed. I was intubated five hours, five hours after I'd been hit, finally. And they started the necessary care. That night, the city had expected thousands and thousands of survivors. But as you all know, that wasn't the case. So they finally released me out of the lockdown. And on a quiet night, streets filled only with soldiers and the ghosts of those few survivors and the dead. I took my trip up to Wild Cornell. I had sustained an 82.5% burn, most of it third degree. The skin, as you know, is your largest organ. Most of mine was burned away through the dermis or even deeper. And as you probably know, they calculate your odds of survival based upon the total body area burn. So my odds at best were 17.5%. And those odds quickly dropped into single digits and near zero during a series of crises that would last for months at a time. I was put into an induced coma for nearly two months, during which I endured a series of lethal infections, amputations, collapsed lungs, and a host of other challenges that I will endure the rest of my life. And when I at last woke up, I was more helpless than an infant. I could not speak on my own. I could not breathe on my own. I could in no way take in food or perform any bodily function. The picture you see here is a bit later. And it would not be until late November, after stabilizing a slight bit more and having the trach removed, and asking in a raspy voice, how is Gary? You know, how are Joe? How is Cheryl? Can you get me some things from the office? that I would eventually be told that 658 of my colleagues and many close friends at Canner and throughout that building had perished, and that the Pentagon had been hit, and that the world would never be the same. 
And I vowed at that moment to avenge their death by not letting the terrorists get one more. Thank you. People wanted to believe I would survive. Hundreds of Cantor Fitzgerald families had cheered my continuing battle because their loved ones, most of them, were killed. And so they invested all their hope in me. And them and people from around the world that rallied through prayer, and the nurses and the doctors and the people everywhere that knew what was going on, I believe that they were able through their prayer to infuse me with the spirits of those who died, and I believe the spirits of those who died are in me, and that they lifted and carried me through the darkest hours, when it was so hard, literally, to take one breath to another. And I have pledged since then that I would not let them or anyone down. I got so many words of encouragement during that period. The nurses, the aides, the therapists. But in their eyes, as you all know, I could see their doubt. I needed to change that doubt into confidence. My first physical milestones involved the simplest of activities, functions we all take for granted learning to breathe on my own through a steady cadence, learning to speak again, getting into and out of a bed, sitting up like you all are now, learning to walk again. My world had collapsed into the immediacy of now, from one breath to the next. And it was months before it could be taken for granted that I was out of the woods. The first steps came in the tiniest of increments. And being someone that was always thinking about what's next, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, we all have busy lives, I had to rejoice in suddenly the smallest of accomplishments as I mapped my way forward. I worked with my nurses and therapists to understand every possible thing I could about what this injury meant. And my first big ask was walking from the bed. On November 12th, I was asked to walk from the bed to a beautiful green vinyl chair in the corner, four feet. And I figured, these people, <laughs> that was it. They do not have high expectations. This is going to be easy, no problem. Well, as I went to stand up, I never before felt such a shaking and trembling in my life. Now, mind you, I wasn't standing up on my own. There was a, a nurse on either side and therapists as well. My legs felt like they, were they would buckle in a moment. They had been cast since the time I'd come into the hospital to stop the atrophy, as you all know, that sets in when anyone is in a coma. And they l helped me stand up, and for the first time in more than two months, I was back on my feet, quite literally. <laughs> I was shaking. The tearing of the graft sites felt torturous as I stood. I felt things breaking open. I mustered that pain. I used it. I used it. And like a mountain climber, I looked toward that summit of that ugly green chair. And I started to take my first step forward. And another. And another. And when I finally got there, they turned to help me sit down. And if I thought it hurts standing up. Can't imagine telling you how much it hurts standing down. Caught a real swift clip from behind, and my hindquarters were incredibly burned. I, if I had been carrying the American flag, boy, though, I would have planted it right there on that chair. And that simple journey felt harder than anything I had ever done. But on the day of the walking mummy, as I came to call it, I became ambulatory again, and it was intoxicating. I planned at night what my next task would be, 
They said step out into the hallway. I thought, well, I want that nurse's desk. That seems to be where all the action is going on. So three days later, I took an improbable journey that I didn't know at the time, which was to walk with assistance 40 feet to that nurse's station. And as I began to walk, doctors and other nurses on the ward and therapists gathered around and my, my nurse ran out into the hallway because it was the morning to see if my parents had yet arrived. And when I got there, they all stood clapping, cheering. And I could not imagine why. And what I realized at that point was that they had invested their hope in me and that my journey was their journey and that this was certainly a joint celebration. And in that moment, we had become in a city made into a war zone, a true team, a true band of brothers and sisters. And together, for the remainder of the time I was there, we moved forward with no intention other than I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to, again, not let those terrorists get one more. So 90 days to the day, I am released from the ICU. And by virtue of their nominal agreed to tolerate failure in my own, so much more was possible during my stay there than ever would have been. But I must stop for a moment and pause back to the most miraculous moment before I left, which was my son, the reason I lived. A few weeks before exiting, it was finally safe for me to see him. And on November 17th, they said, you're safe too. There I was, gussied up in my finest bandages in hospital whites, sitting in a wheelchair. The nurse had said, put a little perfume on. My dad brought some up and my mom to dab on the outside of a bandage. If he can't recognize you, he may recognize the scent. I was afraid I was petrified that he wouldn't recognize me, that worse yet, he would be repulsed by me, for I looked nothing like the mother who had left him a few months ago. And as they wheeled me out that morning, I looked down the hallway, and there was this little boy pushing a toy the little red balloon on it saying, I love you, down the hallway. And he came up to me, and he looked at me, and he looked away. My heart sank. And then he turned back toward me. My mom's saying, that's your mom, that's your mom. It's our little girl. And a small smile came across his face. And I looked at that child, and I knew at that moment that we had not been lost to one another. And everything that I had hoped and prayed and fought for was embodied in that moment, being reunited with that little boy. We began to share many of the same milestones as we were learning to walk together and speak. <laughs> And as I mentioned, countless surgeries in 90 days to the day, I shipped out to Burke Rehabilitation Hospital, where I would spend more than three months rebuilding my strength and really starting the rebuilding of my life. My son and my husband were there every weekend. My husband was there every night. During that period of time, I first came to look in the mirror and I looked into a mirror where I knew as my ear had crumbled away on the pillow, seeing black flecks that it was gone. And I looked at a face that was so completely different. But I saw my eyes, 
And I knew that although this rolling, panicking feeling inside me was there, and I cried, I had my pity party, and I knew I had to get over it. It was still my face, my year that I had left. And I thought about that fear that paralyzed me years ago, and I embraced it, and I wanted to crush it. And so I redirected my, in my energy. And a little more than half a year after that beautiful morning I'd left for the office, at last I was returning home. And what surrounded me during all those months were people like you see here, the nurses, therapists, my parents, that love that holds and lifts us what was a united team effort at every single step in the way. Now the second leg, though, of my campaign would begin back at home, and I would face years of operations, healing, rehabilitation. As many of you may know, I would need to wear compression garments, nothing pleasant, nothing like you wear to cover a little bulge here and there, a silicone mask on my face 24 hours a day, layers of silicone to control scarring, hypertrophic scarring. And what I knew at that point was the greater part of my recovery still lay in front of me. But I also knew what I wanted. My goals were clear. I wanted my life back. I wanted to do the smallest things we take for granted, spending time with family and friends, going for a walk, picking up my son and holding him. Yet out of the hospital, it was very apparent that the world had moved on, and I began to really appreciate how incredibly weak I was. But despite, and despite all the strengthening, I got tired easily, and I was easily exhausted. But as you yourselves know, exhaustion doesn't matter. I had a hard deadline. In the burn business, you have 24 months to maximize the extent that your limbs will move, and beyond that, you are in lockdown. And the world would not stop for me. I would just have to catch up. So in a sense, I was starting back on the bottom, and it would be years before everyday tasks were once again familiar and routine. So I went to work. Rehabilitation was my full-time job. I had hopes of an entry-level job anyway, which was getting back to everyday life. I did it six days a week, and on the seventh, someone came into my home and helped me out as well. I remember pushing my son's stroller on a windy March day, the sense of accomplishment. My hands were bloody just from the touch of pushing it, but I felt just like every mother out there. I remember going to the movies with my husband when finally I was able to remove the gloves for a few hours at a time. And we slipped in there in the dark, and I felt like everyone else, and he wrapped his hand in mine. And for one of the first times in months, I felt my flesh against another's. I've come a long way since those early days, and I knew my life would be forever different, but I learned that different was okay. And that ultimately change really is the only constant in our lives. So I had to embrace the life I still had but I couldn't have traveled a further distance from where I had begun. But the skills that brought me the success in both, building a career and rebuilding a life were the same. Surrounding yourself with a good team, making sure you understand the business. And I want to share a few of them with you today. Lesson one, defeat is temporary. My parents had raised my sister, my brother, and I to understand simply, things happen, my dad would say, and you're not the first one they've happened to. When they do, there's only one direction to go, and that is forward. I had been catastrophically injured in an act of war, but my battlegrounds were sterilized rooms, my battleground surgical grounds, gowns and masks and splints and bandages. Pain was my enemy. I studied it, I anticipated the ways it would take me down, and each night I laid in that darkened room hoping to fall asleep, crafting 
my battle plan for the next day. And I always ask myself the same question, how can I win tomorrow? So I brought the battle to my enemy, the pain, the joints that wouldn't move, the skin that wouldn't move. I chose to attack rather than surrender. Another lesson I learned was something that I had believed as a young person playing sports was embedded in me at that time. The win is in the effort. The win is in the effort. No matter if you lose, if you put in your best effort, you put it on the win side. And when I looked into that mirror and knew I was different, I managed to take it in but move beyond the obvious truth. And I realized holding on to those negative emotions wasn't going to help, but I could let them coexist. And I took that energy. And even though I was far from fully healed, I would need to bring everything I had to it every day. I faced a mountain of ongoing surgeries, one about every seven weeks, physical and occupational therapy continuing six days a week. But I willed myself to look beyond the circumstances. And I designed that if I could project a confidence, I could be so resolved and so present and unharmed that people wouldn't see me as a terribly injured person. They wouldn't notice the scars. And at some point over the last 12 years, although the mirror still tells a different reality, that charade became a reality. And I feel that that injured woman disappeared and a new version of myself, my old self emerged. Because even in the most unpredictable of situations, when chaos is all around you, and especially then, the ability to focus on your core vision is essential. And the answer to why I survived against all medical odds is because ultimately, like any of you who are successful, as you all are in your business, I believe because I willed my mind and my body back to the world, and because of love. And yes, I had the help of many, but there is nothing going on unless you yourself want it to happen. And I had a stronger belief in my power to prevail than any fear that I wouldn't. And that was my strength. I dared to imagine not what was probable, but what I dreamed possible. During my recovery, there were many breakthroughs and there were just as many setbacks. And I figured, bring it on. The harder it comes, the harder I'm going to push back. And I began to enjoy that continual push. And as I had in business starting a company, only to pour my heart into it and see it fail, there will be times, as you feel, and where I certainly felt defeated. But what I began to understand was those defeats were temporary, those setbacks and I could let them become part of who I was without conquering me. When I knew that fingers would no longer work again, when further amputations had to occur. And what I came to understand is certainly the challenge of business, the challenge of my time, of our time, is to embrace those temporary defeats. Find a way to use that disruptive power to my advantage, to your advantage. Remember, Love what you do because the path to success is the same as the path to failure. And despite all the best tactical and strategic planning, the unexpected always happens, doesn't it? The virus with no good antidote. The computer, that, the competitor that appears out of nowhere. The technology that dramatically changes the landscape in your community. What we thought we understood on a day of stark terror out of a clear blue sky, changed everything. But what I learned is you can't regret what you haven't done and you have to look to what you can do. I confronted defeat, but it was only my response that ultimately really mattered. And it was also all, often after innumerable breaking points where I never thought I'd be able to flex my ankle again or put my left shoulder down, that that success finally began to come to me. And if I could fight through that fire, if I could extinguish those flames, get out of that war zone, if I could take that next breath and that 
learn to walk again, to talk again, to use my hands again, to live with a body that was forever changed, different than before, that living was still here for the taking, and I considered it a win. Because one of the keys to success in business, as you know, is knowing when you're presented with a true choice and when you aren't. When you may think you have an option, you need to understand when you really don't. Because if you cannot execute that plan, you got the wrong plan. You've got to revise it or you will fail. Be persistent. We don't know how strong we are until strong is our only option. I knew that day I was not going to fold up and die by the side of the highway. I made that decision is. But the fact is, all of us experience adversity when we feel we are at our weakest. Yet later, as I did looking back, I saw that even then I had the power to choose, the power to act. And I realized a strength that had not been measured until that critical moment. And at that point, I felt it. It felt boundless. And just as you and we as individual, individuals, collectively as organizations, face these tests, we tell ourselves, if we only knew then what we know now. But if that exercise teaches us anything, it's that if we had understood our true power then, we may not have felt such doubt. Think about the times you felt that way. The real lesson is not about how strong you were, you, how strong you are or were back then. It is about how strong you are right here, right now. That is your unmeasured strength. My own unmeasured strength brought me, brought me from beneath those burning towers to stand in front of you today. It carried me on a journey I told you was measured in the smallest of increments. My hands were so badly burned, no one could say I would ever regain any function. The notion was I'd probably have just two mitts at the end of my arms. When I left the ICU, my hands were fresh from surgery, full of joint fusions, amputations, protruding pins all over the place. I couldn't move my fingers. I couldn't flex my palms. But over the years, my hand from work went from this to this to this. And I was finally able to make a fist. I was finally able. I was finally able to wrap my hand in my son's own. And this is your unmeasured strength. This hand was my power, as it is for all of us, that no matter what is happening, there is a power we all have inside of us to persevere, to prevail. And my experience of injury and recovery confirms that in crisis, attitude is everything. Attitude faces the tone of an organization. It, fa it, it, it influences that nurse's floor that you are on. It influences the decisions and actions of yourself and of others, our associates, our teams, even our enemies. Because I showed my commitment and I was able to recruit others to my cause. I worked with nurses. I worked with people who were just as committed. This is how great transformations are made. There are many kinds of leadership, but there is only one criterion for success. And you all know it results. I wanted 100% recovery. But I, knowing it was impossible, still said, that's what I stand for, 100%. And those that were up to the task joined me. And together, we achieved that goal. We worked harder, longer, and more than we ever had. And we shared the epiphany in realizing that we are capable of far more than we imagine at times. Because how we act in times of adversity defines us. The nurses on the floor of that ICU, the nurses in Burke Rehabilitation Hospital, the nurses in hospitals that I've been at since then, they stood there. They understand that in every life there is a reckoning. And when you face it, you have a choice. Panicking is easy. And if you panic, or if I panicked back then, I would have been dead. But as that Chinese maxim 
says crisis and opportunity are really the same, right? A mishandled opportunity becomes a crisis, and a well-managed crisis can become an opportunity. My father, a for the Marine, said things are going to happen. And when they did, there was only one direction to go, and that was forward. And often, he would crystallize that advice into a simple, elegant proverb, which meant, get over it. And that's exactly what he said. Get over it. In the toughest of times, in the latest of innings, against the greatest challenges, how we respond reveals our true character. Every day, we begin again with the choice, which is really just a series of hundreds of thousands of deliberate choices, all of them answering the same question, asking myself as you ask yourself, am I willing to get in the game? Am I prepared to do what it takes to win? These are the moments we, we have to rebuild when we have to start over, when we have no choice but to accept our fate. I have faced those defeats but I would not believe I was defeated. All of us have been wounded in some way, but though you cannot pretend that you have not been touched by adversity, you can refuse to be held by it. Keep going, believe in yourselves, believe in each other, believe in your mission, and never give up. Theodore Roosevelt said, something I'm rather fond of. Far better is it to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, though checked by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much, because they live in the gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. I want to be remembered to have dared mighty things, to have won glorious triumphs, even though checked by failure so many times. Every day is its own milestone. Every day brings a new challenge. When you open your eyes, it is a privilege. This is it. This day, right here, right now. You can change how people think by the way you think. Strategize beyond the obvious. Look at what actually makes things work, not what people tell you is the way it works. Find the truth. Do what you're good at, but also do what you need to do in order to get there. Every day, you have a choice. Will you choose the gray twilight of complacency, or will you dare mighty things? I had a stronger belief in my power to prevail than in any fear I wouldn't, and that was my unmeasured strength. Will you gather your courage and take those steps, the steps of commitment, the steps of leadership that will be remembered for generations within your family, within your community? Find your passion, be relentless, and meet every day with your own unmeasured strength. Here I am carrying the torch for the first world around torch bearing in 2004. That was an ultimate win for me, standing and running on behalf of our nation with a flame above my head. I could not have been any prouder. Remember, every day you have a choice. Make it count. Thank you. You are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.